boys and girls, let me be the first to introduce myself. My name is Leroy Jenkins, and I bet you're wondering, like, what a fine chap like me is doing here. Well, first off, you're stuck in class, so you're obligated to be here. <laughs> but besides that, I'm here to take you on a magical journey. A magical journey to a faraway place where the sun is always shining and the air smells like worm root beer. A place where you can eat your soup right out of the ashtrays if you want to. It's okay, they're clean. <laughs> a magical faraway place where the shiners and the lepers play their ukuleles all day and anyone on the street will gladly shave your back for a nickel. Waka waka doo da yeah. That's right, ladies and gents, we're gonna be learning about Mokman's The Coming of God. Gee willa, cause I bet you're excited. So let's not slow this racehorse down, daddy-o, and let's have a super good time. Our first stop on the theological merry-go-round is skit time with Migliori and Pals. In today's skit, there is trouble in theology land. While Christian theologians agree on the importance of Easter witness, they interpret it in very different ways, as evidenced by these four theologians, Bolte, Carly, Panny, and Multimon. Faith is not dependent on the results of the historical inquiry, as you seem to be suggesting. Of course, faith presupposes the fact that Jesus of Nazareth really lived and died. But the Easter Kirkma is the independent of these claims and counterclaims about the historicity of the traditions of the New Testament. Talk about stupidity. Your interpretation of the resurrection seems to me completely incoherent. What you appear to be saying is that the resurrection didn't really occur at all and that the rise of faith in the disciples and in us is the resurrection. You rob the Easter faith of an objective basis that put it in the category of hallucination. Unlike you, when I say that the resurrection is an act of God, an event of revelation, I do not empty this act of its objectivity and concreteness. I do not reduce it to a mere cipher for a change of mind by the disciples. Hold on, you two. Don't you see that you're both equivocating? You both talk about the resurrection as historical in some very strange sense, an inaccessible event of revelation or new self-understanding. This is utterly out of touch with what the word historical ordinarily means. Thus you end up divorcing faith from concrete history. I agree with you, Pannenbergian, that the principle of analogy, as Boltmann apparently insists on using it, should not be allowed to go unquestioned. If we demand that something can be considered historical, historically real, only if it can be conformed to our present experience, history is a closed a priori, and our understanding of it can never allow for the coming of the genuinely new and unexpected. I prefer to speak of the resurrection as an event of promise, an event that makes history, that opens it up, that disturbs all our so-called established facts, and that makes us dissatisfied with the status quo of human alienation, suffering, and injustice. Oh no! It looks like these gay lads have a pickle on their hands. Maybe someone should have told them that the resurrection cannot be proven through modern historical research or reduced to private personal perspectives of the disciples. Within its framework, or apocalyptic eschatology, the resurrection is open to multiple interpretations. To help these gay lads out, let's look at some dimensions of the resurrection of Christ. The theological dimension. A theological interpretation is the resurrection was an act of God. The God of Israel praised the crucified Jesus. Jesus, or just as Jesus died for us, so also he was raised for us. Migliori, page 193. It's the Christological dimension. A, Christological interpretation views the resurrection as the fullness of humanity. B, the risen Christ is the one who came to earth in human form, the one who lived among us, the one who is obedient even unto death on a cross. C, through Christ's resurrection, humanity is seen in its exaltation. Pneumatological dimension. A pneumatological interpretation views the resurrection as beginning on the new creation. Believers participate in the new life in Christ by the power of the Spirit. 
the ecclesial dimension. An ecclesial interpretation views the resurrection as the beginning of a new community. The community of faith is where the living Christ is encountered, acknowledged, confessed, and obeyed, but it is not the ultimate source of power of the risen Lord. That's from Migliori, page 195. Political interpretation views the resurrection as a proclamation that Christ is risen, constitute <clears throat> the challenge of all principality and power of the world. The Cosmic Dimension A. A cosmic interpretation views the resurrection as the beginning of God's new world. B. To believe in the resurrection of Christ is to believe that God will not only triumph over the violent death that reigns in human history, but also will triumph over the tragic death to which all life is presently subject. Miligore 196. Wow, those dimensions sure did razz my berries. Now let's hear from Carol to get the dealio and some sweet Moltmann eschatology. For your God Moltmann. Thinking of eschatology as only about the last days or last things is to spoil one's taste for the penultimate things, the dreamed of, the hoped for. Or to put it another way, he says the person who presses forward to the end of life misses life itself. He feels so strongly against this way of thinking that he even uses the unseemly language of final solution when he talks about apocalyptic eschatology. Instead, he argues, Christian eschatology is about the new creation of all things. It is about the remembered hope of the raising of the crucified Christ. So it talks about beginning afresh in the deadly end. For Moltmann, eschatology is about eternity being always at hand and breaking into the present as opposed to thinking of history marching toward an ultimate conclusion when history or time will transition to eternity and the kingdom of God will come into its full expression. Before exploring what he calls his eschatology of hope, Moltmann briefly reviews the more linear understanding of eschatology and considers how what he calls the transposition of eschatology into temporal terms came about. The sources are familiar. First, the prophets. Prophetic theology of the 17th century read the Bible not as God's revelation, but as prophecy of the future world. Predictions about Christ had come true, and those not yet fulfilled about the end times would eventually come true too. The revelation of John gained stature, and prophetic theology was developed on the idea that history and eschatology, or the experienced present and predicted future, lay along the same temporal line. Second, there was Albert Schweitzer in the 19th and early 20th centuries who developed the consistent or thoroughgoing eschatology as he sought to use historical critical method to cut through the dogmatic icons of the church's Christology. He wanted to bring people in contact with the true Jesus of Nazareth. Instead, Schweitzer found a Jesus whose expectation of the transcendent breaking in of the kingdom was disappointed many times. Jesus also transmitted this sense that the end was imminent to his disciples and as a result did violence to history as it became a thoroughgoing, not yet view of history. A view built on an optimistic faith in progress, which meant that they were ever anticipating a better day. Third, in his Salvation History Theology, Oscar Coleman also works within a linear view as he seeks to mediate between the not yet and the at hand. For Col Coleman, time is differentiated into sections of salvation history, and time takes its quality from what God allows to happen in it. After Christ is the time of the Spirit and the Church, and, and Schweitzer's idea that the delay of the kingdom's arrival was a disappointment represents an error in perspective, according to Coleman. For Moltmann, the linear approach fails because the time in between Christ's ascension and return lasts too long. The linear notion is not in fact, fact biblical. It is essentially a historical deism. Moltmann points to World War II as a major, World War I as a major turning point in eschatological theology. Responding to the horror of war, Karl Barth and Rudolf Bultmann put forth the theology of crisis, as did Paul Athuasis independently. For them, the ultimate questions 
and answers were not to be addressed at some illusory end of history. Rather, there's only one time, eternity. Every moment in time bears within it the unborn secret of revelation, and every moment can be thus qualified. The kingdom of God has moved out of the sphere of expect expectation into the sphere of experience. The kingdom does not come out of the future. Golly gee, things are sure heating up. Let's cool things down with Sweet Feet McGee and some beat poetry on eschatology of the coming of God. God was. God is. God will be. God's future is not that he will be as he was and is, but that he is moving and grooving towards the world. God is in his coming, not his becoming. Dang. The coming God means a God that no longer passes away or dies. God and time are linked like sweet, sweet love. Don't think of God as a future, but an advent, baby. A future that comes from the past and present is nothing but a slave to that from which it came. But an advent, Baby, a parousia has that messianic hope. That's right. It's not a second coming, but a God who's been here all along. God's power in time must be acknowledged as the source of time. Past future, present future, and future eternal. It's an experience, an experience of a lifetime, the foundation for salvation, shifted from the past to the expected future, into a new hope, hope founded in love, sweet, sweet love. The new announces itself in the judgment of the old. It doesn't emerge from the old, but is born anew, that new creation. The new has come, Oh yeah, to return the lost and renew the past. God was, God is, God is coming. Advent eschatology, baby, that's what it's all about. Our next stop on the theological merry-go-round is history time with the rebirth of messianic thinking in Judaism. This dapper fellow is no other than Ernest Bosch. Bosch is the author of The Spirit of Utopia and is famous for his thoughts on Messianic Judaism. Out of the ashes of the First World War, Bosch tried in 1918 to find a new beginning in search for the heritage that had been lost, and found it in that which had sought all past civilizations as the one thing as salvation. For Bosch, there was no theodicy within the world system. What there is is an enduring indignation over injustice and the suffering of the poor and weak. His real utopias about social justice and human dignity spring from his indignation in which hope takes practical and infectious form in the present. Bosch's spirit of utopia did not look for redemption from history. It aimed at the consumption of history in the eternal kingdom, a consumption which had not yet taken place, but, as he believed, had not yet been fully thwarted either. While vacationing in the Amazon jungle, Ernest stumbled upon a tribe of cannibals and was eaten alive at the ripe age of 92. This fine young flabby chap is Franz Rosenzweig. He is best known for his major work, The Star of Redemption a description of the relationships between God, humanity, and world as they are connected by creation, revelation, and redemption. In his work, he is critical of all Western philosophy that seeks to efface the fear of death and replace actual human existence with an ideal. His hopes were to renew German Judaism from its original eternal sources. Sadly though, Franz died at the age of 43 after trying to receive his trusty kite from the clutches of a dastardly young willow tree. Who is this handsome lad, you ask? Well, it's Jerusalem Salome. Shalom wouldn't believe that when Europe died, the modern reinterpretation of messianism as a faith in progress died too. He no longer believed that redemption could be an outcry of developments in the world itself, as liberal Jews had still taught. On the contrary, he saw redemption as a break-in of transcendence, in which history itself perishes. In spite of his stress on the catastrophic character redemption has for history, Shalom brings out the utopian elements in Jewish messianism. Shalom shows that from prophetic images that regressive messianism has utopian features, and that utopian messianism always has regressive ones too. 
Tragically, Gresham passed away at the age of 85 after being poisoned by his beloved house cat, Mr. Wiggles. Take a gander at this snazzy chap. It's Walter Benjamin. After the disaster of the First World War, Walter B Benjamin tried to find a solution to the new definition of the relationship between history as the 19th century understood it, and redemption as the messianic faith expected it. Benjamin saw the meaning of history not in the connections of history as a whole, but in history's wreckage and fractures. Benjamin does not view the secular as a category of the kingdom, and on the other hand sees the downfall of what is earthly and fulfilled earthly happiness, positive cooperation between human beings and the Messiah. Little is known about Walter Benjamin's later life. Disappearing at the age of 48, it is rumored that he was abducted by aliens. Take a gander at these two gay lads, Jacob and Carl. Soon after the end of the Second World War, two moving works appeared in Germany on the history of eschatology. In 1947 in Zurich, Jacob finished his doctoral thesis on Western eschatology, and Karl returned from his Japanese exile bringing his book on the theological implications of philosophy of history. The two books resemble one another in their historical content, and they treat the same thinkers, but in their intention they differ fundamentally. Jacob turns back from Western eschatology to his Jewish roots. But in Tokyo, Karl has come to esteem Zen Buddhism philosophy of nature with his book he intended to depart from both Christian and historical existence in order to return to the circular courses of nature. In the end, their disagreement led to their untimely demise. Jacob and Karl, facing off in a vicious bar fight, choked each other into oblivion. Whoa, Daddy-O, that's a lot of info to process. Let's take 10 minutes for all of you to figure out who's driving this crazy umbrella. <laughs> Ladies and gents, I hope you're caught up, because it's time to saddle up and ride that dolphin. Let's check in with my cool cat, Jana, and hear what she has to say about death and resurrection. Moleman shares that when people live in the shadow of death, it can create a barrier to living life. It is when we live in the suppression of the awareness of death that we are living a dying life. In living with the notion of death, we become apathetic towards people and ourselves. In this life, there is an understanding of a life beyond. When we think of the soul, it is not something that is physical. In Maltman's view, our soul is where our love is, and the spirit is the breath of the life that is loved and loving. Death and life are about love. It is in the love that we have, in which we share with others, that we are living. However, when we let that flame of love die, it means we live in death and we are no longer living. In modern times, Maltman addresses the lack of grieving and mourning. He links the inability to mourn becomes an inability to love. But not taking the time to slow down and embrace that we are not fully living. Fear of death constricts, while hope for eternal life opens a wide space for living beyond death and brings serenity into the soul. Nothing will be lost and you are missing nothing. In examining the concept of resurrection, there are two types to look at. The self-assurance of the invulnerable soul and the assurance that God will create a new life out of death. For Maltman, he sees the resurrection being a place of hope. I see it only in a life projected towards God. In to domain severia. In thee, O Lord, have I put my hope. It is in life that we know love and God. God is with us through our suffering, rejoicing, and our experiences. It is in the hope of the eternal life, which is the final healing of this life, and into the completed wholeness for which it is destined. The human being lives wholly, the whole human being dies, God will wholly raise the human being. 
That sure is groovy, Jana. Hey, cool cat Sharon, you got anything that's far out you want to add? Where are the dead? Are they sleeping, body and soul, until the resurrection? Or are they souls in an intermediate state of purgatory being purified? Or are they already risen with Christ in eternal bliss? The first thing that Moltmann goes into detail, um, but the doctrine of purgatory, uh, Moltmann discusses uh, in depth and uses uh, examples from Michael Schmaus in his Catholic Dogmatic, and who bases his work on uh, doctrines from Pope Benedict from 1336. And uh, one, an image that a lot of us have um, that will continue to, I'm sure, is the literature from Dante, the Divine Comedy in 1319. Then purgatory was the place that you would go to be cleansed. From your sin and purified and ultimately to go to paradise but we know that this idea of purgatory is completely incompatible with the teaching of the gospel that um, God is not a forgiving God and, and do what he did to sacrifice for us to turn around and um, I believe and put you in the situation where you're paying for sins I mean that the real basis for doctrine of purgatory is not scripture or tradition, but the church's practice of prayer and penance or tradition, if you'll have it. And one could argue too that if purgatory, if you go there to pay for your sins, then aren't you, doesn't it become a work of righteousness? And as the reformers say, we're justified by faith, not by our works. There's the doctrine that the, the body is the sleep, body and soul, until the resurrection of the dead, the, the day of judgment, the final day, the second resurrection. Um, so uh, he goes on to discuss that and Luther brings up, uh, uh, he goes on to say uh, that perhaps we are, even though we may be asleep for a thousand years, from the time, the moment we die to the time we wake up, it could be a thousand years, but it's in God's time, if, if we're working in God's time, which we are always, then it could be just an, an ink, twinkling of an eye, just a, a, a second. He also discusses in this chapter um, on the dead that um, have the dead already risen and with are they with Christ uh, in eternal bliss or do they continue to sleep? Also, something important from this chapter is um, the space that fellowship has with Christ. And he, he gives an example of two semicircles, and, and one half of the semicircle are the living, and the other half of the semicircle are the dead. And Christ is between them and brings them together. Uh, so he is among the living and the dead, if you could imagine that space coming together within the circle. He also points out something very profound that the common hope for the future of eternal life and the new creation binds us together. That that's how the dead continue to, to we live among the dead and the dead live among us. And therefore we live together with Christ and that we honor their living by observing uh, their death and remembering them. And that was a very important part and uh, continues to be of the Jewish tradition is remembering the dead and and so it deepens our relationship. Moltmann says quote the community of the living and the dead is the praxis of the resurrection hope. He also goes on to talk about reincarnation, the pros and cons of reincarnation and um, how that's viewed and then he goes on to finish talking about the principle of grace and a distinguishing uh, grace um, for us, which is something that's given by God. Uh, we can't earn it. Uh, he, he is the one who has um, initiated this covenant and uh, points out that if we're going to teach and talk about forgiveness of, forgiveness of sins and the grace of God, that we cannot do that. and, and teach the last judgment at the same time because they're two conflicting ideas. Um, either you are filled with grace and covered with grace or you are for a time but not yet then. But um, and th we do have the now and not yet theme all throughout these chapters. Waka waka do die, yeah! 
Andre, do you have any word from the bird on counseling for the grieving? Anyone who is profoundly affected by death is generally subjected to pain of such violence that even if they are mentally and spiritually strong, they lose their foothold and are overwhelmed. The pain often comes in waves. It is important that we find footholds between these waves. Community is needed to combat the overwhelming pain. In talking together, both the accompanying and the accompanied experience something new. The accompanying persons help the grieving, supporting and encouraging, and those accompanied teach the others by telling their experiences. Listening to each other and talking to each other generates a dialogue in the face of death and with the pain of grief until the loss can be accepted and through the transformation of the mourner, a new community with the dead emerges. Whoa, Daddy-O, that's a lot of info to process. Let's take 10 minutes for all of you to figure out who's driving this crazy umbrella. Wow, boys and girls, that sure was far out. Be sure and tune in next week as we talk about putting a man on the moon. <laughs>